So the next session is uh, Digital Therapeutics, Potential Impact and Challenges by Dr. Pandula Siri Badana. Dr. Pandula is a senior lecturer in medical informatics and medical education at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine of the University of Colombo with research interests in digital health, education technologies, ICT4D, public health informatics, and blended learning. He's a medical doctor by profession, and he has obtained his doctoral degree from the University of Oslo, Norway. Dr. Pandula has contributed to the development of health informatics as a specialty in medicine in Sri Lanka as a part of the specialty board in biomedical informatics at the PGIM, creating a more than 200 strong cohort of medically qualified health informaticians in the country. He has a passion towards utilizing digital technologies, towards empowering people. And this has led to the creation of the self-shield system, the flagship COVID-19 response system by the Commonwealth Center for Digital Health. At present, Dr. Pandula is the honorary treasurer of the Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka and the innovations lead at the CWCDH, which is Commonwealth Center for Digital Health. I would now like to welcome Dr. Pandula. Over to you. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I can share my screen. So <laughs> thank you very much. First of all, um, uh, a big thank you for inviting me for, uh, for today for this, uh, uh, for this talk. I think uh, Dr. Um, Pandu, there's some network error. Uh, and thank you closer. for that introduction. And uh, the topic that I will be discussing today is particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic and, and has, all right, I'll change my connection. So although we are talking about digital therapeutics, we do have problems with digital already. So, so we'll keep that in mind in our discussion as we go forward. So um, as I was saying, I mean, um, with COVID-19, the digital therapeutics gain a lot of attention. And I think uh, today more than before, uh, there are a lot of innovations going into it, a lot of research going into it. Um, and, and today we are basically discussing what this digital therapeutics and what it's all about, the potential, how it can impact patients, the society as a whole, as well as some of the challenges, probably um, the innovators in the, this particular sphere will have. Um, first of all, I would being having a background in medicine, I always like to relate it whatever digital it, with whatever the traditional means of uh, practices that we have been having. So when a clinician or a, a health professional engages with a patient, we always have this therapeutic relationship going. So um, that particular relationship is probably one of the key facts, key key points in um, in in the pathway to recovery and that is being emphasized over and over again um, when we train health professionals um, at any level. It may be at the level of, uh, of a consultant, it may be at the level of a, uh, of a support staff, whoever. Um, the therapeutic relationship is built on several characteristics. And out of that, I have listed few, like the professional intimacy, the power, empathy, respect, trust. Now these things, if, I mean, we all have been patients, right? So when we consider the uh, health professional that engages with, with us, you will see the relationship with these characteristics and how you comply with that particular treatment or how you start trusting that particular professional or the therapeutic method, or how you feel better even, not just by taking medicine, but just by talking to the health professional. And that is the therapeutic relationship that the healthcare professionals uh, attempt to develop or build uh, as much as possible. COVID did impact in terms of developing a therapeutic relationship in so many different ways, but um, we tend to keep it as much as possible uh, um, as much as possible at all times. Now, when digital comes into play, the traditional therapeutic relationship is direct, the patient communicating with uh, the health professionals. With the digital in between, the therapeutic relationship now 
become somewhat artificial in a sense. We as patients now interact with the digital tool where the mobile phone or the smartphone or a digital device that may be able to make decisions is what we are interacting with. So the traditional sense of a therapeutic relationship is now replaced with a digital therapeutic relationship. And that is one of the key things that defines digital therapeutics. Now, what is digital therapeutics in a technical definition is providing direct therapeutic interventions to patients by using evidence-based and clinically evaluated software. And there is a claim to be made either to treat, manage, prevent a disease or a disorder. Two key important things that I will highlight here, the evidence-based nature of the therapy that is being delivered through the software and the fact that it's clinically evaluated software. Something new to digital health innovators in many other spheres, where sometimes evidence-based, although met, clinical evaluatedness may not necessarily be a part of it. So therefore, these two features really define what digital therapeutics is all about. Now, this is something that I extracted from the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, a nice categorization of digital health tools or digital health overall. And digital therapeutics really falls into the aspect of patient-facing therapeutic interventions, uh, where there may be non-digital therapeutics um, measures as well. So you can see that within the sphere of digital health, digital therapeutics is one component of it. And there are so many other components which are relatively you know, not filled up, but I would say there are a lot of work happening in many of the other areas. But digital therapeutics probably is an area that's not much of work has been happening, but probably now there's more interest and more innovations happening in that sphere than uh, any other time. Now, this is again a nice classification of uh, uh, what digital therapeutics is all about and how it fits within the overall digital health ecosystem. Um, it again highlights where the clinical evidence and real world outcomes meet. Clinical evidence is probably the, um, the, the evidence available in the literature that suggests a particular tool or a particular technology may work against a particular health problem. However, the difference in digital therapeutics is that the evidence is used not only um, to develop, but following the development, evidence is used to say that this particular tool gives rise to a real world outcomes um, as against being um, uh, just a digital device that supports care. So that link will be made in digital therapeutics. We will talk a little bit about um, uh, how we do that uh, later on. However, I should emphasize on this last paragraph that is there in this diagram. The purpose and the function of these products are determines the categorization, the risk requirement for evidence and so on and so forth. So therefore, you may have a particular digital tool with you, whether it is considered a digital therapeutic device or a digital therapeutic tool will depend on the claims that someone makes or the functionality or the purpose that it has been developed for. So it is also partly perceptual when it comes to digital tools being classified as digital therapeutics. And this illustrates this particular fact. Now I have just highlighted some of the you know, common categories of digital tools on one column and, um, and, um, and then the three key things that will define uh, a digital therapeutic uh, tool, software driven, evidence-based and making a claim. So if we take, I won't go with, through all, but if I take say, for instance, a wellness app, it may be software driven, but if it doesn't have evidence base and if it is not 
making a claim to prevent, to manage, or treat a medical disorder, it wouldn't be a digital, uh, uh, digital therapeutic. A pill reminder may be a software, but if it does not have evidence base or making a claim for it, for uh, 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 de determining a particular disease or a, or a disorder, it will not be a digital therapeutic. And most uh, of the software falls into these categories. On the other hand, if you have, say, for instance, an AI-based uh, dosing scheduler that can decide on a particular dose depending on certain factors, if it is software-driven, if it is evidence-based, you meaning it has been proved to work as uh, using a randomized control trial type of study, and if it can make a claim to prevent a particular complication from taking place, then that's part, become part of a digital therapeutic. So the interpretation of a tool as a digital therapeutic will depend on these three key facts and how we position this particular tool uh, within the within the scope or within the care pathway of a particular patient. Now we know that. Uh, when we look at um, drug development or vaccine development process, it's a very long and hard, hard, hard process. It involves so many phases, so many regulators, so much of control for a reason um, to ultimately make that particular therapy safe for the patients that it uses. Um, in medical practice, we do have this saying that first do no harm. And that is what I think drives many of these regulatory um, regu regulations that are in place, not to do harm um, uh, when, it, when it comes to whatever the care that we provide. Um, although we consider development as a lengthy process, we all experience during the COVID how fast tracking can take place uh, because we are desperate for a solution and how the regulators eased off of course, with uh, uh, adequate proportions um, to make sure that we gain the solutions or therapeutic solutions within the right possible time. If we had to spend 10, 15 years to get the COVID vaccine, we would have gotten in 2030. And probably by that time, um, you know, half of our earth may have been managed. So it's, it's possible to fast track things, but still it needs adequate amounts of evidence um, collaboration, uh, involvement of a uh, lot of agencies, researchers, clinicians, and also the people in the society in order to get those things done. Now, while the drug and vaccine development process is such a hard as hard and you know arduous and and a, and a complex process, it is it is not possible for us to imagine that digital therapy will be any easier because here also what we are trying to do is to treat or give therapeutic, make therapeutic decisions on behalf of the patient, which now has to be safe, efficacious, as well as um, do what it's supposed to do. Um, and, and that particular, uh, uh, particular aspect cannot happen overnight. It will take time, it will take multiple stages, it will take multiple stakeholder involvement, and therefore it will be a lengthy process. Now, generally when we develop digital tools, the, the cycle is somewhat similar to any software development life cycle, and we are very much familiar with uh, that kind of a development process. And it don't, doesn't take uh, uh, too long to develop uh, this kind of uh, uh, any digital tool um, if we have the enough resources in doing so. However, when it comes to digital therapeutics, there is not only a phase for developing the digital part of it, but there is also a phase that required to develop the therapeutic part of it. For instance, when we talk about digital health, uh, digital therapeutics product development, it will also have a preclinical phase. That is the phase where we may search through evidence, we may identify potential technologies, use those technologies for prototype development and do the testing and see whether the functionality, if it is, works uh, properly and so on. So that's preclinical 
phase. It's kind of similar to drug development where you probably look at the, um, you know, we probably natural ingredients that might have certain chemical properties. You do lab tests to see whether that has an effect. And, you know, that kind of work goes on in uh, before you come up with a pill. So it kind of is similar to that particular uh, phase of it. Then we will have a prototype, which we now need to use to gather data. And that is the phase that will allow us to validate some of these um, functionalities that we have incorporated into prototype two. We will probably be assessing how usable, how user-friendly, how applicable it is in a therapeutic setting, how people interact with it, user interactions as if any other software. Uh, however, the difference here would be that we will probably use that prototype uh, for small scale pilots clinical studies. And there, the specialist or the clinicians will get involved, which probably will not happen uh, in other types of digital tools. Of course, it's possible that it will happen, but the systematic and organized type of studies um, uh, will happen even at this phase even at a small scale to ascertain whether those um, functions uh, do uh, work as well as that these prototypes do not cause harm, as I said earlier, uh, when the patients are using it. And this also means that these studies cannot be done um, uh, overnight or cannot be done haphazardly. You need to take the ethical clearance, validation, necessary approvals before you do it. Then we are getting into the development or the certification phase where we do the improvements, we generate, de develop the full system, and then we go into large scale controlled trials that is acceptable for the regulators, the physicians or any others, so that the evidence is enough to justify the use of this technology as a therapeutic measure. And this probably be the longest phase in the development part of it, and probably the hardest because it involves the regulatory um, clearance as well as um, as well as um, uh, as well as clinician involvement in a big way, um, and also a lot of resources probably will be needed in order to complete this kind of a phase. So this gives an idea as to how uh, a digital therapeutic product development takes place. Now I would like to bring in. Uh, Sorry, a few examples from, these are not any particular order or uh, any preference, but just to tell you some of the tools that may be available as digital therapeutics. This is from the library of the Digital uh, Therapeutics Alliance. Um, um, some tools working on say, helping managing diabetes, um, some work on um, uh, alcohol dependency or other substance dependencies to uh, care for these people, to provide them with cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, in some instances, it may be used to measure the doses delivered through an inhaler connected to an app uh, so, that, um, so that the patients know that they have taken the right dose at the right amount and whether they have to take it again or when they have to take it again. So the management of uh, that particular patient is now uh, being, um, uh, being supported through these devices. And then some will measure you know, the lung capacity, breathing capacity, so that they know when to take the next pill or when to take the next inhaler or when to go to the, when to go to the doctor. So these tools are, are, are considered digital therapeutics, as I said previously, because they show those characteristics. Uh, they, 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 are, uh, they are based on software. They have evidence to suggest that it's, uh, it's effective, it exerts a clinical outcome, and it does make a claim. And these are the three things that defines these as therapeutic, digital therapeutic. And I'm sure there are so many other therapeutic tools that are used widely uh, by people. Now, a little bit about um, uh, that, uh, our own experience from the Commonwealth Center for Digital Health. This is probably have not yet reached the level of a digital therapeutic, but I'm um, bringing it in because to show the stages of uh, development. This is a tool that we developed um, uh, based on what the research that we have been doing. 
a tool that was developed pre-purposed actually for COVID, uh, uh, COVID care and was launched in Sri Lanka as a, as a support tool. What it basically does is it uh, captures the symptoms and also the breathing sounds uh, and other um, uh, voice related sounds uh, using the app and analyze it to ascertain whether the person is actually um, uh, developing a breathing, you know, having a breathing performance um, change, whether it's lowering or whether it's uh, uh, keeping on to, a, um, to the baseline, that's type of an input. So based on that, to provide the patients with an input to say, okay, now it's time for you to go and meet a doctor. Now, this does not meet the characteristics of uh, digital therapeutic one is that um, it is not yet having um, uh, not yet having you know the clinical trial type of evidence which is a must for clinical therapeutics um, digital therapeutics as well as um, uh, as well as uh, the claim we do not make a claim to uh, for it to diagnose COVID-19 or to diagnose any other it's basically ascertained whether there is a change in terms of the breathing performance um, or whether the symptoms indicate a potential for COVID-19. So, uh, so, but this is in a stage where we are scaling it up to the level of a um, level of a large scale studies. And, uh, and that is probably the stages in which any digital therapeutic solution will uh, move on. And the use of uh, gamification and the use of uh, digital you know, the voice and recording uh, tools available within the mobile phone makes it easier for the consumer to be used and particularly to empower them. And that is probably one of the key aspects related to digital therapeutics that we will we will uh, be considering. Now, the potential for digital therapeutics is enormous and I didn't actually list it anything. I have another slide that lists, but these quotes from the web at different points uh, does illustrate the need uh, and the potential. For instance, there are so many millions of people who actually die of not taking the necessary medications at the right time in the right dose. And that's why the dosing schedulers are important because that can save lives. And also, um, um, the, there is a lot of uh, stigma associated with particularly mental health uh, related therapeutics where the digital therapeutics can fill in because digital therapeutics have also already been used in providing psychological support uh, and therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for various types of uh, disorders. And also there are sensor devices linked with uh, apps that actually can uh, identify particular uh, deficiencies in your heart rate or the rhythm. A uh, few minutes earlier than uh, earlier uh, to the patient actually feeling any symptoms, which probably can save the patient's life. So these are the potential of digital therapeutics. And in addition, um, it actually expands the reach and more people can access these tools as well as um, clinicians will have more reach. That's what happened in with the tool that we introduced also, as with many other digital tools around the globe, where the clinicians now have more access to the patients as well as patients having more access to the clinicians. Now, whatever we do involving humans, we always consider ethics as central. And even with digital therapeutics, this is something to be emphasized on. The autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, which is not to cause harm um, uh, and be equitable in terms of its use, as well as ensuring that people have the autonomy to decide are, max, are important in digital therapeutics as well. There can be so many challenges as with any digital tool, there can be so many challenges. And this basically highlights some of these challenges uh, across the board. However, the regulatory approvals, the need for clinical validation um, are perhaps the two key challenges any innovator will, uh, will face when they introduce or develop um, uh, digital therapeutics. And that is where you will need a multidisciplinary team as against software designers or engineers. You will need clinicians. You will need bioinformaticians. You need um, uh, other types of experts to come in in order to get this thing, um, get the, get the uh, solution up and running and get the necessary regulatory approvals. At the same time, 
uh, we know a little, only little about the digital therapeutics landscape still and not knowing what it can do to you patients as well as clinicians are unaware so therefore building trust making them informed of the solutions as well as getting their support may also be a challenge and that's where the adoption uh, related um, activities become uh, important last but not least the digital divide and health inequity some argue digital therapeutics is not really a challenge. Uh, the, these are not necessarily a challenge for digital th therapeutics, but it's a solution. It may also be a challenge in particularly low resource contexts, how to get these solutions that probably can save lives and improve the health and well being of people to these populations who are traditionally marginalized and have no access to uh, good quality um, healthcare. And that is where uh, we we need frugal innovations in this sphere. It's not necessarily high tech that can become digital therapeutics. You can develop um, frugal innovations that can support these populations uh, also and make them stakeholders or uh, limit, uh, avoid the health inequity or digital divide that might become worse if digital tools are introduced uh, without much planning or much consideration. I will end with some um, scenery from the Sri Lankan context uh, for you all to see. And um, I thank the organizers for inviting me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandula. Though we have a couple of questions, but uh, in the interest of time, I will just put across one. So, which is how far have we come in terms of effective regulation and reimbursement of digital therapeutics? What are some of the barriers? So in terms of regulation, it's very hazy. Uh, different countries have their own methods of doing data protection acts don't really talk about digital therapeutics as yet. But uh, European uh, countries do have their own uh, regulations on digital therapeutics, which are emerging, so Germany, France, and so on. Uh, US, the FDA has its own pathway in terms of certifying digital therapeutics. So that's a good move because that allows innovators to get into these programs um, and, and take the benefits of that fast track approvals. But this is nothing in, you know, um, um, if it is a digital therapeutic, it will have to go through, through those processes. So this, these processes are also being tested out, emerging, uh, but you have to be aware about what is there in your own context if you are to go ahead. Um, uh, I think the second part of it is uh, with regard to reimbursement. I think there is a move even with the NHS that um, um, uh, the physicians or the clinicians um, will be able to prescribe digital tools uh, instead of patients choosing. And uh, these validated tools will then be available for physicians to prescribe. And I think that'll, that, is a, that is a trend that is emerging uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, and that will then be reimbursed or will be, you know, insurers will also be willing to cover. And, and of course, the um, most, um, you know, prominent challenge for us to move ahead is perhaps is the uh, regulatory and ethics related challenges, uh, which, uh, which, which I suppose uh, will be overcome with time as more and more um, innovators um, and digital enthusiasts um, uh, will become aware of the pathways that uh, that can be taken when developing these tools. I hope I answered that question. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak at the summit and join us. Thank you very much for the inviting.